Well, I hope you've had a good start to the month of June. I hope you've had a good start to summer. And gosh, there's already a lot of plans, a lot of activity going on. And, and I know there's a lot of excitement as, as people have plans to go on vacation and to take family trips and, and all of that's great. And I'm, I'm excited for you and I hope that everyone has safe travels and has a, has a wonderful summer. Our, our Sunday School lesson today is titled Clearing the Way. And it's our lesson for June the 11th. The focal passages are out of Malachi and Luke. And the purpose statement is to weigh whether promises of future deliverance and visions of a lasting peace are sufficient to help us with the struggles of life now. Now that's an interesting purpose, isn't it? Whether the deliverance and visions of a lasting peace are sufficient to help us struggle or help us with the struggles of life now. And when I started looking at this lesson, i got to admit, it bothered me a little bit because I thought, you know what, we do struggle. We do struggle. And, and, and I, there was a question that I asked myself, and I actually thought about putting it onto Facebook because it would have been interesting to see what people would react or how they would react to it. And the question I was going to ask is, why do you go to service as a church? And I also saw a study or heard about a study just this past week that said that there is a greater percentage of people than ever before in the United States that don't even believe that, that it is important to go to church at all. They don't believe that it's important to, to worship God. They're not, sure that, they're not sure there even is a God. And that's disturbing. But for the people that go, why do you go? Why do you go to church? What are you seeking when you go there? Now let's face it, we, we all have expectations. And many times our expectations fail to match up with reality. And we start questioning, and, 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 and questions lead to other questions because we, we want answers. Now there are some people, and let's be fair, some people go to church and they show up with no particular expectation at all. But, but, but I say this, and I say it often, and I say it to myself as a reminder, and I share it with other people as a reminder, that everybody is on a faith journey. Some people, and I think we need to acknowledge that, some people don't know they're on a faith journey. Some people don't realize that, that what it is that they're looking for, but everybody's looking for something. Everybody that, that gathers together at anything, at any kind of an event, they're there expecting something. And what are your expectations? Now, clearly, there's people that come to church year in and year out, and they never are dissatisfied with anything. They never question anything, whatever happens at church. I mean, the preacher, yeah, he, he, they're good enough. They're generally satisfied with the programs of the church. Yeah, there's a lot of things I don't participate in, but they seem to be going okay. You'll never hear any griping. You'll never hear any grumbling from them. And they don't really require much of the church, and so that's their secret. But the reality is that there are things that go on in the modern church. We're all people. And, 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 and when we start realizing that, we, we realize that, that there are issues that we need to be, that we need to be dealing with. There are going to be people that are hurt. There are going to be people that are offended. There are going to be people that are disappointed. And people that are just described as going to church, sitting through the service, not really care if they connect with anybody, don't really care what's going on down front, just knowing that there's something going on, they just, as I say, their expectations are low. And they don't expect much from anyone. They put in time to check off the box that they went to church. I mentioned before, I had a friend and, uh, when I was in college, and we would go to church. and had, We would go to different services. I had a Jewish friend who would go to the synagogue sometime. Uh, I had a Roman Catholic friend, and this particular friend was Roman Catholic. We'd go to church with him sometimes. And he used to brag about the fact that we could go to church at 4 o'clock on Saturday to a, a folk mass and he would get his name checked off that he had been to church that week. But, but I, I want to submit to you there's much more to that in going to church. Because the reality is there are some people that go to church and they say, I want to know more. I want to dig deeper. I want to get my hands dirty. I want to go and, and I want to be involved with the homeless. How do I do that? I, I want to be able to, to take care baskets to, to people that don't have as much. I want to be able to, to go shopping to buy things that they need. I want to be around them. It's not just a matter of buying it and delivering it and being done with it. I want to be part of that. I want to get to know them personally. I want to get to know their families. And so there's this whole mix of people that, that go to worship together, all seeking something. 
Now I'm going to read the passage today, and then we're going to go back and we're going to discuss a few things from it. The first uh, passage that I'm going to read is out of Malachi, and Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And as we've said before, the whole Old Testament points to the coming Messiah. It points to the coming of Jesus. In Malachi 3, 1 through 4, we read, Look, I am sending my messenger who will clear the path before me. Suddenly the Lord whom you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you take the light is coming, says the Lord of heavenly forces. Who can endure the day of his coming? Who can withstand his appearance? He is like the refiner's fire or the cleaner's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. They will belong to the Lord, presenting a righteous offering. And then we go over to Luke, and we're going to talk a little bit about how this, this whole story unfolded, but we're going to go ahead and read the passage first. And it starts in Luke 7 and begins at verse 24. It says, After John's messengers were gone, Jesus spoke to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A stalk blowing in the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed up in refined clothes? Look, those who dress in fashionable clothes and live in luxury are in royal places. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. He is the one of whom it is written, Look, I'm sending my messenger before you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you that no greater human being has ever been born than John. Yet whoever is least in God's kingdom is greater than he. Everyone who heard this, including the tax collectors, acknowledged God's justice because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and legal experts rejected God's will for themselves because they hadn't been baptized by John. To what will I compare the people of this generation, Jesus asked? What are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace calling out to each other. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a funeral song and you didn't cry. John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine and you say he has a demon. Yet the human one came eating and drinking and you say, look, a glutton and a drunk, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved to be right by all her descendants. Three times it is recorded that Jesus asked those crowded about him what they were seeking when they went out to hear John the Baptist. Now, I just wonder if Jesus was in our church services on every Sunday, what would he ask? What would he be saying? Would he be looking at us saying, what are you looking for? And, and perhaps Jesus could ask of each of us, what do you expect to see when you get here? Because that was his message to the people who were listening to him. Or maybe the question would be good to ask, what do you think Jesus can do for you? We attend services with expectations. We come seeking something. We always do. When we walk through the door into the sanctuary, we come seeking something. And do we know what we want? And the message that we hear today is meant to challenge each one sharing the services to clarify and to ask ourselves, why are we here today in the house of God? What do you expect from the Lord Jesus? All of us are people who have needs, and I think that's one of the first things we all need to recognize. Sometimes we look at somebody and say they've got it all figured out. Oh my gosh, they've got it together. They've got a great family. They've got great children. They've got great grandchildren. They're, they're, they, they live in a fine house, they drive a great car, they've got good jobs, or they had good jobs, and are now retiring, and they never have to worry about anything. But the reality is, we really don't know. And the reality is, everyone, everyone has needs. We're all concerned about something. The older we get, no matter what we've got in the way of resources, the resources are, are there just to provide for our needs. But we can't help but look back. We can't help but look back and, and, and have regrets over things that we didn't do or have regrets over things we may have done. But the reality is we all have needs. We all have concerns. And, and those concerns are different as we, as we navigate life's journey. It would be good to ask, what do you think Jesus can do for you? Now, let's be honest about it. 
too many of God's professed people just want to hear a message that makes them feel good. They want to feel good about how they're living, the decisions they're making. They want to feel good about the choices they're making, no matter how self-serving those choices are. And, and, and you know, I've talked about in, in years past, and you may have heard the term, the prosperity gospel. If you just do what you're supposed to do, you're going to be successful and you're going to have everything you want. Measuring success by what you have. And that's a, that's a scary thing. I reflect back on that. I can, I, I can remember well, there have been many ministers, the TV evangelists, who preach the prosperity gospel. If you give to my ministry, if you do this, if you buy this, this cloth, if you do, do whatever, then you're going to be prosperous. And they define prosperity as having things, having riches. And, and, and yet, is that what we're searching for when we come into church? Is that why we come to worship God? Is hopefully if we put our, our tithe in the offering plate that it comes back multi, uh, multiplied many times? Do we come because we want to be told that everything's okay and it'll always be okay? Are we, do we not come if we have hear a message that makes us feel uncomfortable? That we don't necessarily like to hear a message that challenges us? That a message that, that when we walk out we're not distressed about hearing it because we think we need to do something different? Jesus challenged the people who were following him. They had heard John's messengers ask questions. And I want to go back for a minute and kind of set the story before Jesus responded. You'll remember that John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. We know he was preaching, he was baptizing, and drawing incredibly large crowds to his ministry in the desert region around the Jordan River. Eventually Jesus, we know that, was baptized by John the Baptist, and he began his ministry, which soon drew large crowds of his own. But then, if you read earlier in Luke, Luke notes that because John dared to reprove King Herod, for unlawfully marrying his brother's wife, Herod had John thrown into prison. And after languishing in prison for, we're not 100% sure, six to eight months, John began wondering whether Jesus was in fact the promised Messiah. And so he sent two messengers to Jesus to ask him what was going on. Now think about that. <clears throat> think about it in your life. You've been in a situation, I've been praying, I've been asking for help, I've been asking for direction, I've been asking for this medical diagnosis to, to get taken care of so I don't have to worry about whatever it is. And you begin to question Jesus. You begin to question God. What, what, what do I need to do here? If, if we went back and read verse 20, it said, And when the men came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he then healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor of good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Now let's face it, it was a challenge. John was human. It was a challenge for John to stay the course. It's a challenge for us to stay the course. We, we don't quit serving because we pass through a rough stretch. We don't allow ourselves to become discouraged because things just seem too dark for us. The exchange between Jesus and the messengers John had sent was conducted openly. And the people who crowded around Jesus heard the exchange and knew of John's struggle and, and his times of deep distress. Now make no mistake, to be incarcerated in Herod's prison would have been a trial. To be there with the knowledge that his wife hated you would magnify the stress. And John would shortly lose his life when Herodotus' daughter demanded that Herod bring her head, the head of John the Baptist, on a platter. When we struggle with questions, when we wonder about the validity of our commitment to Jesus, our struggles are never really hidden. I mean, sometimes we try to internalize them. Sometimes we think, I don't want to bother anybody. I don't want anybody to know. But when we're around people, when we're around people that we know, when we're around people that we've shared with, when we're around people that we've celebrated with, when we've cried with, when, we, when we've mourned the loss of other people, they begin to know us. 
And, and they, they start understanding. They start to look at something's wrong. Something's not right today. What's the matter with you? They know when we're struggling. Even though we try to keep our doubts secret, they, 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 they see that there's something wrong. And, and I want you to think about, as we finish up this lesson today, the importance of, of being open with your feelings. I'll never forget, and I've shared this often, we had a great friend, Frank Mays. Frank was a pastor, he was a marine at one time, and he became a, a Presbyterian minister. We became great friends with, with Frank and his wife. And he would use a term when somebody would say, I, I felt your prayers. I, I felt when, when, at night when I was dealing with, with whatever I was going through, I could feel the fact that, that you all were praying for me. And he responded, and he would respond frequently, and I've always loved that. Thank you for allowing us to walk with you. Thank you for being open. John sent his messengers to Jesus. He couldn't go himself, but he sent a couple of friends. And, and that's what, what being Christian, that's what being people of faith means, is that we share with each other. We don't always agree with each other, but we share openly with each other. And when we see a need, when we see a hurt, we respond to that need, we respond to that hurt. Peter would later write, Beloved, do not, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. My friends, we're all going to go through troubling times, not just once. We're going to go through times in our life and, and, and our life journey, our faith journey is a roller coaster sometimes. But we always know, even though there's a dip, it's always going to climb even higher. And, and God sends us people, sends us friends to share that journey with, that we can rely on. As I've said many times before, that we can cry with, that we can rejoice with, that we can reflect with. It's important because we're created in God's image and those friends are messengers of God that we can rely on and help us get through those low points in our life. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for this message. It's, it's so important for us to remember that we are going to have challenges. We are going to have times in our life. We're going to have rough patches. But we also know that with faith, and with, with coming to you with our challenges, with sharing our challenges so we can draw on the strength of others, we can get through anything because that's what you want for us. We just ask as we go throughout this week, you continue to keep our eyes open to things you want us to see, our ears open to things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing, overflowing with that love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.